I want to pick up on the topic we've been exploring, which is refuge in turbulent times. You know, when the winds start to blow and the storm comes, as it clearly has with the coronavirus plague and, and other issues um, people are dealing with both here in my home country, America, and around the world, um, when that happens, including just ordinary interpersonal issues or stresses or burdens, when that happens, it's so important to find what is a refuge, what gives us a sense of sanctuary, protection, refueling, and inspiration. What can we draw upon? What is reliable? What lasts when so many other things turn to rust? So we've been exploring that. Um, in last week's talk, I talked about the Buddha's fundamental insight that uh, we need not suffer in our experiences if we don't hold on to them. In other words, if we don't hold on to the unpleasant ones by pushing them away or hold on to the pleasant ones by grasping them and trying to keep them and possess them. The question then becomes, how do we practice that fundamental radical insight of release and freedom in relationship to our experiences? How do we do that while, as I do, having a to-do list every day? a checklist, uh, goals, needs, obligations, um, deadlines, uh, emails. How do we do it? How do we also honor wholesome aspirations in our heart to actualize ourselves and develop ourselves, uh, help other people, promote the cause of social justice, and, and even um, how do we honor the desire for enlightenment, awakening, in a context in which we are also to be letting go? This is a very deep question, isn't it? It's a very fundamental question. And um, so uh, a bit about Buddhism and the Buddha's own background. As I talked about last week, he trained himself in deep ascetic traditions of his time, uh, nearly starving to death, uh, just living out in the wild uh, in northern India of his time, giving everything away. And he found that that um, aversion really at bottom to the ordinary life did not bring him to his complete awakening. It was only when he found the middle way in which he neither uh, craved the sense pleasures of the world nor feared and hated them. He found a middle way. It was when he found that middle way that he was able to attain his own liberation. And um, in two key ways I'm going to mention right now, he promoted um, healthy goals. In fact, there's a word for it in Pali, the language of early Buddhism, uh, problematic desire. Uh, the word for that is tanha, whose root meaning is thirst. There's an underlying sense of something missing, something wrong deficit or disturbance, that, it's the, that is the basis for the desires that get us in trouble. On the other hand, there's another word, chanda in Pali, for desires broadly, goals, wants, aims, values, aspirations, chanda. Um, those are desires that include things like taking a sip of water if you're thirsty, or wanting other people to be able to come to a meditation gathering now online, or wanting to feed children, or enable them to learn how to read, or uh, you know fix a leaky faucet. These are wholesome desires. It's okay. And I want to give you two examples of this right now. And then I thought we could do a kind of mini micro experiential exploration, and then I'll open it up for particular issues and questions and discussion here. It's interesting that uh, the Buddha talked about, in his phrase, that happiness visible in this present life. Happiness visible in this present life. And he said, among other things related to that, in one particular teaching that I'm going to refer to right now, he talked about four bases for the happiness of householders, not monastics, although they could enjoy some of this in some ways, but really the happiness of householders that's perfectly okay. 
and he talked about four sources of them. First, he spoke of the happiness uh, visible in this present life that comes from possession. Isn't that interesting? Possession, uh, appropriate possession, like just knowing you have enough food, uh, knowing that you have clothing, knowing that you have shelter, uh, knowing that um, in our Western world, you're you know, making some provisions uh, for your old age. Uh, that kind of happiness. Uh, someone complimented me on my shirt. It's my shirt. I admit it. I like my shirt. Someone gave it to me, and it's a possession of mine. I like it. Uh, I remember a story about the Dalai Lama, who as a monk, uh, possesses very few things, and he held up his watch, and he said, I like my watch. It, you know, it's a good watch. Uh, a very simple one, actually. So the happiness of possession. Second, there is the happiness of enjoyment. Hmm, enjoyment. The Buddha says enjoyment is okay. Well, yeah, uh, enjoying music, enjoying the sound of the bell. Enjoying the company of others you care about, the company of others you wish well. Um, enjoying the smell of jasmine coming in through a window, enjoying the sound of birds. Uh, enjoying a sense, as you put it at one point, your own worth, your own value. Uh, finding gladness in your own goodness. Enjoying, enjoying. It's okay to enjoy. Then, in the 2,500 years ago setting of his time, he talked about the happiness for householders in being free of debt. This is a very interesting one because I think what he's talking about there is the sense of unmeetable obligations, just the sense that you're always two steps behind, uh, two paychecks short of what you really need, uh, you know, not able to get out from underneath some kind of crushing burden, which unfortunately is the case for peop many people around the world. And by the way, I want to be clear, um, just because it's okay for us, uh, for, for people in general, to seek that happiness which is visible in the present life does not mean denying at all suffering. That's the first truth in Buddhism, the truth of the fact of there is suffering certainly. Um, and also, it doesn't mean, you know, turning a blind eye to the happiness that others are lacking, even while appropriately enjoying your own happiness. So that said, I'll move on now to the fourth happiness, which I think in some ways is one of the most interesting of all. He called it the happiness of blamelessness. In other words, the happiness of uh, of knowing that you've conducted yourself uh, with integrity today, with, with honorableness, not that you have to be uptight and you know really hyper careful about not breaking any rules or doing anything wrong, but that there's a sense of, you know, um, I wasn't a jerk today. I mean, that's what I say to myself. It's a low bar, but you gotta start somewhere. Uh, you know, just, I didn't mistreat other people. Uh, I didn't lie. I didn't steal. Um, you know, I didn't certainly directly kill any living thing. Uh, I didn't uh, engage in toxicants of one kind or another that lead to heedlessness and cloud the mind. And I didn't mistreat myself or other people through my sexuality. I mean, these are the five basic precepts in Buddhism right there. Uh, a bliss of blamelessness, the sense of, you know, uh, with thought, word, and deed, I did the best I could today. And I can go to sleep and rest in that sense of without needing to be a saint and without needing to have a halo. Um, yeah, I did okay today. You know, kind of, I was impeccable today. And now let's see what happens tomorrow. So those are four kinds of happiness or four bases for happiness in this present life. And I also want to mention another form of wholesome desire, thoroughly endorsed by the Buddha. The uh, values, desires, the values of what are called the Brahma Viharas, the dwelling places, the Viharas. Where do you dwell? Where does your heart dwell? Or saying it a little differently, but the same thing. What dwells in your heart? Does compassion 
dwell in your heart. You know, empathy for the suffering for others and caring and good wishes toward them. Does kindness dwell in your heart? Do you dwell in kindness? This is a second major value, uh, the wish that others be happy and not merely not suffer. Does your heart dwell in what's called altruistic joy, sympathetic joy, the happiness at the happiness of others? You're glad for them, right? Can you rest in that? Well, that too is a value. That too is a wholesome desire to cultivate that mudita in Pali, that happiness um, for the good fortune of others. And also, can you value equanimity, the fourth Brahma Vihara, and the, and the one that enables the other three, that fundamental sense of emotional balance? Can you value that as well? It's perfectly okay to value these, to aim for them, to desire them, and to cultivate them in yourself over time. It is sometimes conventionally said that Buddhism is against desire. No, it's against in the sense that it's against, or really more exactly, it really uh, surfaces a critique of the ordinary life of attachment and points out that it's both futile to attach to transient experiences and a sure prescription for suffering. In that larger frame, it's perfectly okay to um, aspire, to aim, to wish well for others and for oneself. So how do we do it? Now I want to get very practical and open it up for, um, uh, for discussion. So let's see, I'm going to turn up my gain because I can see there's a little wishing here. See, it's a healthy desire that people can hear me, right? All right, a little more gain going up, and maybe that's about right. Okay, I'll keep going. So I wanna try a little bit of an experiment here, an experiential experiment. I suggest, if you like, that you pick some area in your life that uh, where you're goal-directed, you know, you're trying to get stuff done or you think you ought to get stuff done, but it's not a happy place. <laughs> You know, it maybe it's stressful or you, you feel uh, you never get enough done with regard to it. You feel like you're falling short. You know, you're, you feel critical of yourself. You're, you're hard on yourself. Pick an area, if you could. Pick an area. Maybe it's like, oh, the dishes. Maybe it's simple. Or maybe it's something big like, wow, I just have to get, you know, to get more exercise, but I never seem to make time for exercise. Or maybe you've got something you're trying to do in your business or you're trying to help something happen in your family. Maybe it's a closet or a garage that never seems to get organized. Pick something where you're goal-directed and it feels kind of stressful. All right, so we'll do this in three steps. In the first step, with regard to this area, um, just kind of explore in your mind the feelings of stress or pressure or drivenness related to it. How are those factors of what is suffering for you with regard to this, I'll call it project? This, this goal you have. What's your ordinary way of approaching this goal? Okay, now in the second step for this um, goal, ask yourself, what could be relevant, wholesome values or desires, wishes, longings in your heart related to this goal?
Are there virtuous purposes related to this goal? So, for example, if I were to do this, um, and I'll do it related to uh, emails, which are okay to send me, fear not, uh, but you know, I get a lot of them and there you are, I gotta deal with them. And if I don't deal with the ones that came in today, there'll be twice as many tomorrow, et cetera, et cetera. So I would say with, re with regard to the first question, you know, what makes it feel stressful? I would say things like, um, I never seem to get to the end of it. Um, you know, it feels like it's always coming at me. There's a sense of pressure, a sense of, oh, I got to do it. It's like, it's frustrating. Okay, that's the first one. The second, what are the virtuous purposes or wholesome aspirations related to it? And I would think, well, wait a second here. Emails are my form of correspondence. It's how I relate to other people. And I, I want to relate to other people. I want to relate to other people with um, virtue and benevolence. <laughs> to use two fancy words, uh, I want you know friendliness and helpfulness and um, constructiveness to be present in my dealings with others, which are mediated a lot through the channel of exchanging email communications with other people. It's a field of communication, and I want to you know I have wholesome desires that I'm re reflecting out loud about right now to communicate in ways that, as I say, have virtue and benevolence woven into them uh, and are skillful. Oh, those are, those are values. Also, it's a value for me to be constructive, to get things done, to accomplish things. And that's a legitimate purpose as well. Um, hmm. Another very legitimate purpose is that through emails, I relate to the world. I'm engaged with the world. I make contact with the world. The world make con makes contact with me. That's a wholesome purpose. Okay, hmm, that too, that too is a virtuous purpose. See kind of how to do it? That's, I'm doing it myself. Maybe you can relate to emails also. Uh, so, um, I would, and then I would say more broadly for this example that emails are linked to larger purposes of supporting my family with my livelihood and keeping our operation afloat, uh, you know, engaged in the world, uh, doing projects, uh, keeping a website going, fiddling with it, offering a relationship workshop. Uh, you know that this, these emails, which can seem like very narrow tasks, actually are about larger, completely legitimate purposes, you know, putting bread on my table and um, you know, keeping my business afloat and still here, still helping, hopefully. All right, okay, good. So now for you, here we go. Identify one or more of those virtuous purposes, those wholesome values. And instead of the first way of relating to your goal, your project, stressful, pressured, contracted. See what it's like to get in touch with your positive values and to feel like they are a kind of wellspring or a kind of updraft or current carrying you along. So it is these positive purposes, maybe lovingness, maybe service to others, maybe the desire to actualize yourself and uh, express your abilities and go full speed, really enjoy the talents and the strengths that you have, feeling that this is what's lifting you and living through you as you do various things. I'll be quiet for a moment here as you just take a little bit of time to get a feeling for this. What would this be like as a way of relating to your goals or your projects, your tasks?
For example, you could have an underlying purpose of contribution, of service, helpfulness. What would it be like to feel lived and lifted by that purpose? Or you might have a purpose of supporting yourself and your family. Legitimate purpose. With caring at its heart, what would it be like to be lifted by that purpose? So it is that purpose, in a sense, which is doing the work through you. Or you might consider the purpose of joy, delight, um, aliveness, moving through you as you do various things, being lived by joy, lived by delight, by interest, by exploration, curiosity, playfulness a youngness in you, childlike delight, lived by that. Uh, <laughs> wow, as the current, as the motive force, um, getting your various tasks done. <clears throat> Another virtuous purpose, uh, as Elaine has written in the chat, that we can use our everyday tasks, emails, dishes, laundry, uh, we're doing a job of some kind, we can use those as fields or vehicles for practicing important virtues, such as compassion, kindness, um, patience, generosity, lovingness. Anything we do can be a kind of karma yoga, it's called, a field of practice. That could be a, a purpose. It's like, to use a metaphor, playing tennis and shifting the purpose from scoring points to something like playing tennis with compassion and kindness, or patience, or uh, joy. You're, you're changing the nature of what you're doing. Reframing it into a different kind of game, the inner game, even as you engage the outer one. Okay? So finishing up here with this exploration, uh, in the third step, imagine concretely what your day would be like if you came from these virtuous purposes and kept returning to the sense of them again and again as what is motivating you and moving through you. What would your day be like? What would it be like to do emails or the dishes or other tasks in this way? I'll be quiet for some moments as you imagine that. What would that feel like concretely? And in particular, as you imagine what this could feel like, see if you can bring into the experience of this a sense of fullness, a sense of enoughness already. 
So instead of feeling like something is missing that you're straining to get, feeling instead like there's a fullness already in which you are buoyed toward your aspirations. Fullness rather than something missing. And also as you imagine doing your tasks, being in your day in this way, lived by love and other values, see if you can also bring in an underlying sense of peacefulness in the core of your being. So that no matter what happens, there's an underlying serenity in you as you are lived by your positive purposes. And see if you can find a commitment inside yourself to living more in this way. Disengaging from pressure, drivenness, or scarcity as the basis of action in the world. Disengaging from that. Disengaging. And instead, taking refuge grounding yourself in a way of functioning in life and operating in life in which you are carried along by positive currents of wholesome values. Feel the difference between those two ways of approaching your life and see if you can find a commitment to returning again and again to the second one. Getting things done, engaging the wider world, on the basis of an underlying sense of fullness and peacefulness already, lived by positive purposes such as love. I'm going to be doing more of this myself. Well, I want to respond to questions or comments coming in through the chat. You can push the chat button and type in things if you like. I'll see them. Uh, you can also send me a private message if you want. And uh, I'm going to see if there are some questions I can speak to so far. And I'll try to get somebody else's voice in the room. And then we'll end, as we typically do, uh, in a kind of formal way as we approach half past the hour, 7.30 Pacific time. Uh, and then there'll be a little bit of a mini break five-minute interval, uh, roughly a few minutes. And then those that are still in the Zoom meeting at 7.35 Pacific time will be sorted into small groups, breakout rooms, in which you can talk with each other if you like. And Tom Brown will kind of organize that part. Okay, so let's see. Um, ba -da -ba -da, ta -ta -da. Let's see. Wonderful. You can see the co comments and questions from other people, or rather in the chat. It's really Fantastic. Um, okay, great, great. Someone says, Becky uh, points out, this is like a way of connecting being with doing. It's a really great way to put it. Um, in other words, doing tends to crowd out being, but we can have an underlying sense of being in which doing is proceeding. And uh, you know, I'm, I think what happens over time is we have more and more of a grounded sense kind of in the background of, beingness, including being 
our positive purposes uh, through which doing is naturally expressed. That's another way to talk about it. And I want to agree, this is one of those things we can get all philosophical about. Go for the feeling. What does pressure feel like? <laughs> gotta, gotta do it. <laughs> Not enough time. <laughs> right? What does that feel like? Flip the other way. <sighs> What's it feel like to be productive, engaged, purposeful, generative? without feeling stressed about it along the way. And what enables that to happen? Typically, it's having an underlying sense of okayness, fullness, peacefulness, while feeling lived by positive purposes that carry you along. Know what that feels like. And the opportunity is to return to that sense again and again, when we start getting all contracted and driven. So, da, da, da. looking for a question. Oh, okay, so Jesse Ryan, asked a really interesting question, especially because I'm a major league doer. If I have an addiction, it's to getting stuff done. It's my, my wife well knows. So Jesse brings up, how do you not let yourself fall back into your own default mode in how we relate to our tasks? You know, the unconscious neurocircuitry of it and so forth. You know, we get trained in it. Um, I think one thing that's motivating is to realize that there's another way. Just that alone is really quite profound. Like, wow. I can still be productive without straining. In fact, I'm going to be more productive over the long haul if I'm not so tense and contracted and uptight. Tense, contracted, uptight maybe gets us through a day or a tough quarter at work, but it's no way to run the marathon of an entire career. So that's helpful. The second thing that's helpful is to just notice those cues that create that typical habit of drivenness. Um, for me, it's like I see a bunch of emails like, oh, I got to do them all right now. Whoa, wait a second. And as you become more self-aware about those particular cues, you're less carried along by them. I think that's good. And then last, uh, as a way to motivate oneself in any area, when you're being in the way you want to support, really focus on the rewards of it. Notice how good it feels. Notice the meaningfulness of it. Uh, keep reminding yourself that it's okay. A lot of us, I think, are afraid that, you know, we're going to be caught loafing if we just slow down by 1%. And no, it's okay. Just keep reminding yourself. It's okay. It's okay. They don't care. You're getting it done. It's okay. Okay, great. Do, do, do. Let's see. Questions, tough situations. Yes. I, Nikki Ann Norton on Rex Road. Beautiful. Doing from peace, love, equanimity, rather than doing in order to get love, attention, approval, etc. Yes. Very good. Um, slowing down. I want to speak to slowing down. I think slowing down is actually really important. Um, you know, the crazier it gets, the simpler and stronger our practice needs to be. And for me, one of the fundamental simple practices, <laughs> returning to again and again, uh, the weirder the weirder it gets, is slow down, breathe, see the big picture. Those are neurologically informed. I'll spare you the gory details for right now, but that sense slowing down. Sometimes we can't slow down. We really do have to pull our kid back from the oncoming train or something like that. But most of the time, we really can dial it down. Uh, we don't need to rush about so much. We can move a little more slowly, a little more deliberately. We can pause for a breath between emails, pause for half a breath <laughs> between emails or whatever it is you do, right? Slow it down. And as we slow it down, then we start having more choice and we're less the puppet of our habits that are pulling our strings. Slow it down. And claim the right to go at your own pace. It's very interesting. Like when the phone rings, 
Some people get very agitated. I've lived with them sometimes. Like, I gotta pick it up. Roommates in my past, not my current family. Ah, oh, you can't let it ring. And I'm like, I don't wanna to talk to anyone right now. We'll see who's calling. I can let that one go. Um, no, you know, it's like we don't have to be pressed by the, in psychological language, the demand characteristics of a particular situation. Think about as you move through your day, how often you feel obliged to respond to demands coming at you implicitly or explicitly of one kind or another. Sometimes we, we really knew, do need to respond immediately. Okay. But otherwise, it, do we really have to? Or do we have to respond um, on the pace of the other person? Can we buy ourselves a breath or two to reflect, to pause, to come up with something useful, let's say? Can we preserve that? And it's interesting to think about where the word oblige comes from. I looked it up recently. It comes from oblige, liege lord. In other words, it, it's, it relates to obligation. It relates to the sense that there's some duke or king or queen that you owe duty to. You're obliged to them. And that's your, you know, your local baron. You have to placate. And it really puts it into a certain frame, doesn't it? That we have to obey them somehow. Those who must be obeyed. Well, do we actually have to obey them? Or, in fact, in your world, and you might want to ask yourself, where can you just not necessarily go to war with somebody else, but on the other hand, feel not so obliged, not so demanded upon that you just have to hop to it? Okay. So I want to see if uh, there's a question that someone would like to offer or a comment in, um, uh, you know, from the group. Anybody want to speak up? And I'm going to enable you to unmute yourselves for the one person that I'm going to call on, but please don't other people unmute yourselves because then it'll become very noisy. Okay? So anybody have a question or a comment? I'll kind of scan through the field. Anybody have a particular situation? how to have a New York Times bestseller whilst trying to stay kind of chill. I don't know if that's possible, but anybody? Anybody? No? 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 Yay, I see Judith Ann. I'm going to unmute you. Yay, Judith Ann. You are unmuted. Oh, hi. Hi there. I guess um, the question I have has to do with, um, I guess I was noticing, in the, especially in the, in the meditation mm -hmm. that when you say to let go of the fear or whatever and yeah and i notice it's like it kind of comes on like Argh! what do you mean sort of like, say more not, Judith. It's, uh, the fear is not amenable to be letting go oh okay yeah and sometimes it can get stronger right as soon as i talk it, about it it somehow it comes yeah, forward it's like, yeah. it's like don't think about a pink elephant and all you can think about yeah. is the pink yeah. elephant yeah, um, that's but, right. And I don't know. I mean, I notice, I, I mean, sort of like I have my strategies to deal with that, but I was just wondering what your strategy would be. Yeah, um, that's a really great question. So I'm going to, um, I'll just respond. Fear is really pervasive. And um, when I was in training to become a therapist, my supervisor had a saying that much as in criminal investigation, they say, follow the money, in psychology, follow anxiety. Be aware of anxiety. Be aware of fear. And it's a really interesting process to observe unnecessary fear. If there really is a tiger about to pounce, Fear is completely appropriate. And if an underlying background sense of anxiety is highlighting something that, a threat, uh, that's important to tend to, let's listen to what that anxiety is telling us. But most of the time, the anxiety we feel in all its forms, uneasiness, a sense of apprehensiveness, 
something bad is about to happen, a kind of sense of dread. It's like the noise of a car alarm. It's not meaningful. It's there. It's un, it's it's suffering, but it's not telling us anything. I think of it some to some extent as a background trickle of anxiety, just kind of hardwired into us uh, to some extent um, by Mother Nature to keep our keep our ancestors on their toes back in you know Jurassic Park or during the Game of Thrones. But for us today, much of the time, it doesn't add any value. It's unnecessary. So that insight right there is really quite useful, Judith, and other and other people. I've I'm anxious by nature, and I've had things happen in my life that definitely made me particularly anxious in my childhood. And so I've really had to I've really tried to work on what is it like to take on board the advice of the Buddha that those who are truly wise are peaceable, friendly, and fearless. What's it actually like to move through life while recognizing dangers? recognizing threats with a sense of fearlessness, not arrogance, not aggressiveness. We could say peacefulness, the absence of fear, right? What's that like? That's really an aspiration. And so I, for me, it's been very interesting to explore what that feels like, including subtleties of it. Now, it may well be that we have trait anxiety for all kinds of reasons, and the darn fear, as it were, keeps returning again and again and again. That's the way it is. But we don't need to identify with it. And in particular, we don't need to feed it. We don't need to reinforce it. We don't need to ally with it and join with it and come up with reasons for being afraid. We can see it more as an impersonal mood. You know, there is, okay, there's apprehensiveness kind of as a mood floating around the background, but I don't have to identify with it. And I don't have to keep believing it. I can know that it doesn't mean anything. That's often the problem. We start with an underlying anxiety, and then we search for what it means, and then we find some justification for it. Or we keep worrying and chewing and ruminating until we find some justification for it, even though actually it's not meaningful at all, and we can let it go. And many of the reasons we're afraid have to do with manipulations of other people both in our history that still live within us and in our culture, our politics, our media, uh, uh, commerce, uh, the people we live with even. Uh, and I think it's really important to get them out of our head, <laughs> you know, uh, and, to, and to not feel like you're moving through life under threat level orange. When in this moment at least, you're basically okay. Yeah, listen to anxiety, see what it tells you, learn the lesson of it, take care of what you can, and then take a big breath and be at peace. And for me, that's one of the most important practices of all, which is to disengage from unnecessary fear. And to be on your side, yeah. be for yourself. You, you don't need to be burdened by that. You don't need to carry it around. Okay. I better, yeah. yeah, yeah, Judith, and then I'll finish up. Yeah, I guess, I guess my approach is generally to be present. I have a sort of a mantra: I see you, I know you, I love you. Oh, yeah, and I try to be present with the fear and maybe the rage or whatever else might be having yeah. to go on. That's right. With that, with that attitude. Well, that's a very beautiful one, and that I, I think in that already is a kind of freedom. And um, I don't mean to burden you with this, but I just want to name it as a possibility to imagine a mind that is not invaded by fear. Wow. You know, releasing fear and anger. <laughs> that's, a, that's a goal, and it's okay to go after it, I think. All right. And... Take refuge increasingly in what is not scared inside. You know, maybe challenged, maybe pressed, but deep down is fearless. You know, it's like, I don't. Okay, so um, how about we finish here in a formal way? Uh, I've got to wrap up. I'm sorry about that. I see you there. 
uh, with your hand up. Um, so how about we just sit for a few breaths. To feel what it's like to be lived by wholesome purposes. Disengaged from pressure and contraction. Carried along by your natural innate goodness. with all that as the river of your life carrying you along. 